Our lovely band. Thank you, Ken. I was curious when Sean, whoa. I was curious when Sean was gonna throw that violin on his shoulder, but it didn't happen. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, first of all, I apologize for the typo. There's a couple in uh, this PowerPoint. Um, obviously, Church on Fire is what it is. The bulletin is correct. Um, it's been a bit of a week for me. Uh, my wife and I went on our 20th anniversary trip, uh, which was amazing. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting how life happens. On this trip, we got some real just tough news. And, you know, I try not to get emotional every time I preach, but, you know, I got to work through this. I'm. You know, I usually give thanks to somebody in the church, but today I want to give thanks to a believer who's not in the church. <clears throat> As many of you know who are around me, you know I love jujitsu. I'm not that good at it. Um, in fact, in my family, I'm probably I'm the only one with a losing record. I'm a zero, 0 and 4 right now, so my first victory is going to be pretty good. Um, <laughs> all my kids have taken to it pretty well. In fact, Shelby's a killer. Uh, which I'm happy about because uh, the first dude that tries to touch her in the wrong way, I hope she chokes them out. <laughs> <clears throat> but our, in jiu-jitsu, it's not called a sensei, it's called a professor because the level of knowledge you have to get to to black belt jiu-jitsu is, is on par with being a professor. You just have to have such an intricate knowledge of the martial arts, etc. And you've heard any time, especially those who do apologetics, you've heard me use analogies towards jiu-jitsu. I think it has so many life applications. And um, our professor was an amazing man, and uh, <clears throat> he was not just a good martial artist and a good uh, professor, but just in every aspect of life. I remember he taught me one time, um, when it came to kids, he taught me this phrase that I've used, and I use it when I de deal with other people. He said, uh, when you deal with your children, expect nothing and praise everything. And it, and it really hit me home. And so with my kids, I, I realized I'm not raising a Tiger Woods or a Bo Nickel. And so I feel that my kids enjoy sports because they know we're doing it to build character. And I always use that mantra. I don't expect my kids to win. I don't expect them to do anything. But I praise everything they do. They enjoy sports. I've been able to coach wrestling and soccer, and I try to carry this mentality. And I think it's okay. Some people enjoy my coaching. And... He was just such, he was an otherworldly character, and thankfully he was a believer. He's gone to be with Jesus, we found out this week, and apologies, but it's, it's been tough for me. It was very unexpected death, I mean, out of the blue. Um, you know, death, it, it, it's tough. Thankfully, when a believer dies, you're sad for yourself, because you know they're in heaven with Jesus, um, but it's those of us that have to suffer. So I just want to thank him for all the stuff he did for our family. Um, we homeschooled. We were with him twice a week. I was with him sometimes a lot more than that. And he was an amazing man. In fact, I couldn't afford jujitsu under a normal guy. He gave me uh, just an incredible price break for my family just because he liked me and he liked my family. So I can't say enough good things about him. So, <clears throat> okay. Whew. Work through that. All right. Oh, my goodness, man. <clears throat> So today, we're going to finish uh, my series for 2022, which is Church on Fire, which is what we are here at Alpha Baptist. Um, last week, we covered a lot, so I just want to uh, wave top this again real quick. Now, the Church on Fire, and what I'm trying to talk about here is, it's like, you know, y'all, you're in hot water, you're in fire. For those churches there that aren't living as they should, they might not receive the best reception from Christ. In fact, don't know which judgment they may be, may be going to. Um, in fact, Revelation kind of leads you to the point that this is not a saved church. They're church in name only. The church in fire is heretical. They're not su submitting to God's word. They're following culture, not Christ. So what you should always be asking yourself is, what am I crusading for? Am I crusading for the church, the cause of Christ, or am I crusading for some um, policy, culture, something outside of Christ. What is your primary crusade in life? Is it for God's kingdom or is it for something else? 
And if it's not, you probably need, as we read in the verse today, seek ye first the kingdom of God. All right, the church in fire, they are half-hearted. They're not seeking the Holy Spirit. They're living for the world, not in the world. And I've talked about that passage, Revelations 19, um, 1 through 16 maybe, where the second advent, we should all be looking forward to that second advent where we will be with Christ in the air when he comes back to claim, reclaim the earth. And when we live in the world, but not for the world, that helps us through these hard times. It helps us through the trials. In fact, when I lost professor, that was one thing that Leslie and I talked about was, it's, not, it's devastating, but it's not debilitating because I know that I will see him again on the other side of glory. Um, the church in fire is haughty. They're not seeing through Jesus' eyes. They are blinded by their rich blessings, and they're poor as a blessing. And what I found funny, I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. You know, I mentioned last week that I think sometimes we mistakenly believe that when God abandons us, he's going to make us where we, takes away everything, like we're prepping, we're getting ready for it. But really what I think may happen, it, it's in Amos, give me one second. Okay, I can't find it, but in Amos, there's a prophecy. I think it's in Amos 8. I'll find it later. But he talks about he's going to give them a famine, but not a famine of resources, not a famine of people, but a famine of the Word of God. No one's no longer going to care for truth. And I really think that's the famine that is currently occurring in our nation and is in our future, a famine where no one cares about the truth. I mean, think about it. This gender confusion, uh, all this wokeness, truth is not... A factor in this. In fact, if truth were a factor, none of this would even be taking place. People don't care about truth anymore. And that is a famine that I think is destined for our nation. Now today, and I want to say this before we begin, kind of as a parent, I, Liz and I have to remind ourselves with our kids, because in the process of parenting, I don't want my kids to think they're bad kids, but it seems like that's all I do, right? Turn out your lights, Pick up your dishes, let's go do chores, like it's constant correction. And we have called ourselves and we said, hey, we got to make sure we tell our kids they're good kids. Now, some of you may agree with that estimation of my kids. I understand they are uh, a bit wild. But to us, they're good kids. They're what we can put up with. And I, that's what I want to tell you, Apple Baptists. We are a good church. And I hope that we as pastors don't ever make you feel like we are not a good church. We are a church on fire, and this is what I'm trying to inspire us with this last message. But I want to challenge us because to be even better, we have to be disciplined. We have to be hard on ourselves. If you've ever gone and watched an, uh, an air demonstration like the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds, you'll see these guys fly at 200, 300 knots, and they're inches away from each other doing these intricate overhead maneuvers and all this stuff. And to watch it, it just looks so smooth and effortless. For those of you that have never flown jet aircraft, you may not realize that that guy flying is working his tail off. In fact, for the Blue Angels specifically, I don't know about the Thunderbirds, but for the Blue Angels, they can't wear a G-suit because that will affect his ability to, st to stay close because it inflates and deflates and stuff, so he can't have that. And they have to increase the stick pressure because normally when you fly a jet aircraft, you're always doing what's called trimming. So I'm trimming to 1G. So I'm flying, and I'm always moving trim tabs to take it off so it's very light pressure. So I'm with the lightest pressure possible when I'm flying. Well, the Blue Angels is the exact opposite. They have 15 pounds of pressure at all times. So imagine having a 15-pound weight and not holding it with, with skeletal strength but muscular strength and doing quick iterations for 45 minutes. I challenge anybody not to be worn out after that. But that's what these guys are doing. They're flying, and they're just, and they're making such minute, quick corrections. And I really feel that when you desire to be close to God, you become that way in your life. You think, as soon as a thought comes out, you're like, nope, I'm not, not going to do that thought. I should forgive me for that. Like, every little thing you are catching that you're doing, your interactions with people, what you're thinking, what you're saying, etc., it is hard work in my opinion, to draw close to God. Now, the funny thing is, uh, I used this in a paper in one of my classes in seminary, 
and the professor wrote me back and asked if I needed counseling because um, it, uh, it should be very easy to walk with Christ, he said. And <laughs> kid you not, it was pretty funny. I didn't agree with him, but you know, he's, you know I, I'm not going to argue with, a, with the guy either, the professor. So anyway, so when we talk about this, I'm trying to, as pastors, what we're trying to do is to refine us. We're trying to get us as close to God as we can be in the will that he wants for Athel Baptist. So please don't feel that we are browbeating you if we constantly um, work on those or preach those things that we need to address. Now last week I talked about context of the passage that we're going to deal with, but there's something else I want to get to that I think is an overarching principle that I think everybody needs to hold. The verse on the uh, screen there is out of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. <clears throat> I want to read this passage because, and I'm actually going to have to build a sermon on this principle, so I can't cover it in depth, but I just want to put it out there for you so you understand this and you trust in this principle. And the principle is this. The Bible's truths are simple and plainly stated. If you find yourself in some kind of theological system or some kind of way of understanding the Bible or some kind of doctrine that is overly complex, symbolic, allegorical, hidden, etc., and it's going against plainly stated truths, you really need to re-examine what you believe. You see, one of the greatest things that man has done is come and try to complicate and make it so the normal man can't access God. I mean, that is the very definition of what the Catholic Church does. They try to take the keys of salvation away from Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no, there's no need for anybody between a lost sinner and God. That is the entire thrust of the Bible. So any system that comes in and says, no, we've got to work ourselves in there somehow, you really need to examine that. And it's not just applicable to salvation, but anything you study in the Bible where it's a clearly stated truth, if what you believe or hold to goes against that clearly stated truth, it can't be right. It just can't. It's a law of non-contradiction. You can't have two contradictory truths being true. In love and respect, we talk about it. I am commanded to love my wife unconditionally as Christ loved the church. If anything I am doing or I believe in is against that fact that I must love my wife regardless of how she is, etc., then, then that's wrong. That system is flawed and not in alignment with biblical truth. So, so many times we adhere to these systems that unnecessarily complicate the Bible. Because, see, I find it very intriguing that the very chapter 4, God said what? You may freely eat by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day you shall surely die. It doesn't say anything about touching it. He didn't add that. There's a lot more nuance that I'm going to cover in when I build this backup sermon. But I really want you to take away this. When you study the Bible, truths... God as plainly states it, and it's easily understood by people. That was the power of what Martin Luther did. He brought the Bible back to you. You don't need me. You don't need this church. You have God's Word. If you will mind it yourself, you can receive the same truths I can receive through study. That's why we harp on reading the Bible. There's no power in what I'm doing other than just giving the truth of God. Don't ever fall for any kind of system that goes against God desires all men to be saved. If anything goes against God desiring all men to be saved, it cannot be true because God has plainly stated that he desires all men to be saved. So, 
and I'm not saying it's easy, right? We know in Proverbs 2, I love this passage. You cry out for sermon, lift up your voice for understanding, seek her as silver searches hidden treasures. It's not easy. But complexity and difficulty are two separate things, right? If I ask you to go dig a 12-foot hole in this rocky soil, is that going to be complex or difficult? It's going to be difficult, right? But if you ask me to build a shed, that's going to be complex. I don't know the first thing about framing. I call Carrie and I say, hey, Carrie, I need some help. <laughs> so don't fall for, and I'm not saying some things are difficult, and I'm not saying there's meat of the word, but what I'm saying is you can't build a system that goes against plainly stated truths. There's some truths in the Bible that are so plainly stated that you can't go against them. We talked about in Revelation when I went through the reasons why you should hold to pre-trib, millennial, and prophetic is because all of these principles are very plainly stated. They're revealed in the Bible. Revelation 20, the first seven chapters, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. I mean, I don't know. I'm, surely God is saying, how else can I say 1,000 years? So if you come up with some kind of end time system that you hold to that that discounts this, then why? What else are you discounting? So I say this because I want you to be confident in your ability to read and understand and have power in your Bible study. Take the doctrine of creation. Very plainly stated, God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh day. If you choose to discount that and say, you know, I just don't believe it because whatever reason. It will affect your life. Now, is this a salvation issue? No. Can you not believe in the doctrine of creation and still be saved? Yes. I get that. But you can't sit here and tell me that if you don't believe in the doctrine of creation because it's plainly stated truth, that it will not affect your walk as a Christian. I'll give you three reasons why. For those in my apologetics class, you know we talk about this all the time. Probably the three most basic characteristics of a God is that he's omnipotent, omniscient, and infinitely good. So he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and he's perfect, perfect. When you don't believe in the doctrine of creation, if you, it affects your understanding of all three aspects of God in that way. It's going to affect your reverence for God. If you don't believe he created the world in six days... I mean, how can you truly believe he can sustain anything for eternity? I mean, I'm not a mathematician by trade, but I'm pretty sure that the power output to create a universe in six days is dwarfed by the power necessary to sustain a universe for infinity. If you don't believe that God designed this world for us to display his eminence and transcendence, and you think it was just by a random chance, uh, and a random chance is really the only way to explain it, then how does it not affect you? In think of it in contrast. If I see that God created this world specifically for humanity, and he created this infinite universe to showcase how far beyond he is from us, but yet so willing to create a world for us to experience joy, love, relationships, and one in which he came to save us. How can you not recognize the amazingness of his omniscience and what he knows? And finally, if you don't hold to the doctrine of creation, you are left with some kind of evolutionary system with death preceding humanity. And here's the issue. Romans 5.12 is quite clear. Death came through one man, Adam. God did not create death. And what does it also say in that passage? That Christ came to defeat death, and that's why he rose again. Well, if he created death, how, can he cre how could he come back to defeat what he created? And it makes the resurrection nonsensical, which Paul says if we don't have the resurrection, we're the most to be pitied. So it when you don't believe plainly stated truths in the Bible, it affects your walk with him. There's no doubt about it. Now, I, I agree that I am a very simple man. My wife, 
Leslie married me, it drove her crazy that I used to just buy frozen skinless chicken breast and I would buy canned vegetables and that's what I would eat. I would throw a chicken breast on a pan and I would open a can and that's what I would eat. It was very simple. It was very easy. And uh, she was not impressed with that. Uh, I thought it was like a super efficient way of living myself. Um, so I get it. I am a simple man. But this is kind of how I see it. I'm not saying this is how it's going to play out. But just this is what I envision. If I stand before God and he's like, wait, wait, wait a second, Richard. So you're saying you believe I created this world in six days. Why? Because you said it. You believed I, sw- I had a man sw- swallowed by a well and lived for three days. Why? Because you said it. You believed I was going to reign for a thousand years. Why? Because you said it. Every response will be because you said it. I will not fall for the ploy of Satan or anybody else that says, has God indeed said, then turns around and twists what God actually said with half-truths and all this other distortion. You've got to believe what he said. If nothing else, believe what he said. Not what a pastor says, not what a church says, whatever. We live in a time where we have so much access to his word. Believe what he said. All right, so let's get to what he said. If you have your Bible, you want to go there, we're going to be in uh, Revelation 3. Again, that's our passage. If you're new to the Bible, it's the very last book. Thank you for the water, Mike. I always get some grief sometimes because I get so excited up here, I forget to drink water. All right, Whew. all right. let's speed it up. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And before I keep reading, I'm going to try not to knock off. This totally took my pathway. I can't stand on the edge of the stage. It's wonderful boxes up. I know your works, so you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and, as we say in the South, naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now you see here in Revelation 3.18 that Christ gives three specific metaphors and recommendations for this lost church of Laodicea. And in your note there, You see, the church on fire is not hoodwinked and is saving by God's Word. Now, we started out this sermon series with essentials because that is where Athel Baptist stands, on the essentials of the faith, on God's Word. This is where treasures are found. One of the things in life, you know, I've said before that for me, as I've matured in life, I've recognized the fact that I was so focused on results in my life, what I achieved, what I did, and through age, I've begun to understand that the relationships that I make in life are um, the most valuable thing I will do on earth. And one of the most valuable things that you can get from the Bible is knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And the God's grace is so amazing, not just in the essential aspect of His grace, but in the sense that this is available to everyone. This is not something that's exclusive. This is not just for some elevated priesthood uh, or some special hidden church or some monk. Anybody, regardless of how they have lived their life, can repent and then access all of the treasures of God's wisdom if they will just do the work. I mean, what a beautiful truth. I mean, imagine if we were told 
in your backyard, you've got rubies, gold, et cetera, et cetera. How many of us would be digging up our yard night and day until we found those treasures? And God has said, the greatest treasures you'll ever find are the truth, the wisdom, the understanding, the knowledge in this word. And are we doing that amount of work to get to those truths? I can't do them for you. No pastor can do them for me. No church can do them for him. You have to take accountability for yourself, and you need to do them. So let's look at these three metaphors. First, he talks about not, well, I'm going to do these a little bit out of order because I think it just flows better. He also talks about the white raiment that covers our nakedness and shame. Now, I think it's pretty obvious. You look throughout the Bible, uh, especially in Revelation 19 as well, where we'll be in white raiment with, with horses with Christ. It's an obvious symbolic reference to salvation. You see, the Laodicean church has not done the first thing, which is to simply accept the saving knowledge of Jesus the Christ. And that is what a church must be built upon. And that is what we do. We go out to carry the Great Commission that Christ is the only way. It's only through him, his gift of grace, that we're saved and you receive the white raiment. There's no other way to access, access salvation but through the knowledge of Christ. The second thing I want to talk about with this metaphor is the eye salve. And this is where I think it's under important to remind ourselves that obedience unlocks understanding. You know, there's a lot of times where we try to do it the other way. We try to understand before we obey. Those of you with kids know this 100%, right? I tell my kids, you know, you cannot, for example, the boys, they, we were blessed to get some dirt bikes this summer, and they're all the time like, we want to go ride on the road. I'm like, no, you cannot ride on the road. Like, what? why can't we ride on the road? They won't understand. Like, it doesn't under matter if you understand why you don't have the skill to not get run over right now. Like, just obey, right? So many times in our own life, if we will just obey, look at premarital sex, you know? The world is telling us something different. Culture is telling us something different. And it's not until you've been married for a decade or more that you can look back down the corridor of time and see like, wow, if I had chosen to share my intimacy with just a single person, what a beautiful thing, and not fall for the trip. That's one of the things I hope to teach my boys is that your manhood is not based on a body count. And it's something that is very deceiving in this world. And that's why they are attacking the youth with this sexual agenda because they know the power of it, and we have to counter that. And unfortunately for our kids, we can only, they have to make their own choices. And for young people out there, I promise you, if you will just obey God's word, the understanding of why will follow. Don't make the mistake, especially when it comes to God's truth, that I need to understand it before I, I obey it. Because a lot of times, obedience unlocks understanding. It's better to give than receive. You may not, you won't understand that until you, Start giving. And then you will see the beauty and the joy and the warmth and the blessings of giving. But if you try to examine the situation, understand it from all angles, before you give, you will miss the blessing. And that is the asav that Christ is talking about. If you will obey, if you will then you will understand. Your eyes will be open if you'll simply obey. Now, the final thing he talked about there was the gold. Now, one of the things I thought about gold refined is one of the greatest treasures that you get from the Bible is wisdom. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of the knowledge and understanding, right? You can know something, you can understand something, but if you don't apply it, it is pointless, right? I can know that vehicles travel on the interstate. I can understand that a semi-truck is larger and bigger than me, but unless I apply myself to not stand in the road in front of a semi-truck, what good does it do me? Right? So we have to apply. That's where wisdom comes into play is the people who apply the knowledge of his truth. And I'm going to talk about an uncomfortable subject. Maybe not uncomfortable, but I want to talk about an unpopular subject, alcohol. 
Now, I'm not going to sit here and have a sermon on whether I believe alcohol, simple alcohol use is a sin or not, but I want to talk about it from a wisdom standpoint and why I believe as a mature Christian you should not use alcohol. A few reasons. One, the Bible warns against it. It's a strong drink is a brawler. Uh, wine is a mocker. Second reason, we know for a fact drunkenness is a sin. I mean, no one debates that. I mean, we'll sit here and we'll have all these debates and it breaks my heart personally to see churches have beers and psalms and, and write. I've seen pastors write 10 pages and put out on the, the internet about why you should choose to drink. Breaks my heart personally, and I'll continue to talk about why. I mean, why don't we just have uh, bikinis and, and psalms? I mean, why, why don't we try to have all kind of manner of lewdness mixed in with the church? Why not? We know drunkenness is a sin, and I think Dr. Brogy, I heard him say it the best when it came to this discussion. Why as a mature Christian are we trying to tickle sin? Why are we trying to say, oh, I can have this much before I'm buzzing. Oh, now I'm drunk. That's too far. Like, like, why are we living in this zone? Why are we not living in the zone where we say, I want to be as holy as possible. I want to be as far away from actual sin, the perception of sin, as possible. Like, why would we choose that route as a mature Christian? I would advocate if you're living wisely, you are doing that. I'll talk about two other quick reasons. Your freedom in Christ shouldn't be something to pursue the license. To do whatever. Our freedom is an opportunity to serve and sacrifice. It talks about it in 1 Corinthians 9, Romans 14. Uh, I'd encourage you to write those down and study them on your own time. We can't go on those today. But in there, Paul talks about the true mature Christian is willing to give up things he has in freedom of Christ in order to encourage believers, to be a source of exhortation, encouragement to a believer. I know if we're honest with ourselves, we can say there are several people within our church that have either struggled with alcoholism, struggling with alcoholism, or know somebody who's doing alcoholism. So why would we, as a mature Christian, sit there and imbibe? Why? It makes no sense. What benefit does that do? And I'll end it with this, and maybe it's just I'm law enforcement. I was very indifferent about alcohol until I became a law enforcement officer. And now I, I, it infuriates me because I've never known a substance that resulted in more abandoned families, assaulted women, and abused kids than that substance. And if you sit here, it thinks it means nothing. You are a fool. And I'll say this, too. If anything will humble you, it'll be your kids. And I don't have this false notion that the way Leslie and I do our things is going to result in perfect kids. I got it. But I will say this. We have made the conscious choice that we will not use that because I, don't want, my, I want my kids to, to be able to, to know you can have a life of joy, of purpose, in sobriety. There's no need to go down that path. There's zero need. You've got to be honest with yourself as a parent. You can't expect a child whose brain doesn't stop developing until they're 25 to sit there and watch you do it and not think, okay, that is what I need to do when I become an adult. And you are a fool if you think a person is going to have some ability when they first start using alcohol to know the limit. And those of you who've been around it know that's not the case. So I want my kids to know they don't have to go that path. There's no need to go down that path. Now I know I'm fired up. I know I'm passionate about this subject. And I know it's because of my occupation. I get it. But I really think it's something that we as Christians just laugh off like, ah, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Why are we supporting an industry that results in so much abuse, abandonment, and assault. Why? Why would we do that as a mature Christian? Why would we not live wisely and show other people that you can live without this and still have so much joy? In fact, Christ says to be drunk in the Spirit, to walk soberly. So that is my point. That is where wisdom lies, the ability to see, though I have the freedom, I mean, you can... You can not just limit this to alcohol, TV, free time, how you spend your money, etc. 
You have all these things you will give account for, but the bottom line is you have choices, and I can't tell you as a pastor, and I'm not trying to, to browbeat you about this, but I'm just saying wisdom comes in examining every area of your life. Again, back to that blue angel, working your tell all, examining how am I spending my time, what am I watching, what am I reading, who am I talking to, who am I hanging out with, every aspect of your life so you can as we're going to see here in a minute, James 4, 8, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. If you want to have intimacy with God, you've got to make that. He is not a God who forces love or forces a relationship. We have to make that step. Whew. All right. It's fired up about that. I'm sorry. Whew. All right, let's end that first point. Live wise. All right, Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The church on fire is not headstrong. It is sanctifying with the Holy Spirit. Those of you with kids know that when you correct your child, they generally have two choices. They can choose to correct themselves or they can choose to sulk. And we're no different, right? I mean, when we get corrected, we kind of have, when God points out to us what we're doing wrong, we can choose to continue on that path, sulk, ignore it, just deflect, etc., or we can be humble and accept his correction. That's what so much of Proverbs talks about. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son, in whom he delights. I know most of you that fathers, one thing about a son is that I want to create a strong man. And that is hard work for him and me. And so it is an effort. It is a struggle. But I'm willing to do it. The same thing with us in the Lord. If he wants, if you desire to be a strong, mature Christian, it's going to take work. And he's going to put you in painful situations with awkward people, uh, with Southern preachers that just blah, blah, blah. You're getting all these things that are going to make it difficult where you're going to have to choose, I am going to sacrifice, I'm going to serve somebody I don't like. It is easy to serve a pleasant person. Honestly, is it not easy to serve somebody who's thankful, who's fun to be around, who's all that stuff, right? That's, why, that's my issue with with uh, people that leave the, a church and decide to start a home church, right? What difficulty is it is to pick your four best families and start meeting in your own church? That's a dinner party, right? Come to a church where people are difficult, a jerk. They're struggling with all kinds of issues. They're ungrateful, selfish, hypocritical, etc. That's where you will learn to be Christ-like. You serve God's lost. You serve immature Christians. You sacrifice for those who are not going to say thank you. Right? Again, back to marriage, right? Probably one of the most difficult aspects of marriage is being taken for granted. You know, and how do we often react, right? Um, you know, one of the things I do, I always try to make the bed every morning. It's just, I guess, the military in me and... Uh, you know, I guess my wife's picked on up because she's just like, hey, I've come home at 2 o'clock. The bed's not made. It drives me crazy. So I'll, like, make the bed. <laughs> I try to make the point, and then I'll, like, you know, I won't come out to talk to her. I'll, like, be in the room and be like, hey, babe, what's going on? And call her in and just be like. <laughs> right? We don't feel we're getting gratitude in our own marriage. The person we should love the most, and we try to, like, <sighs> I can't believe it took three minutes to make a bed, right? As we become mature, we learn God knows. Wasn't that his complaint with Mary, right? His complaint was not with Mary that she was serving. It was she was complaining about serving, right? There's, God loves us to serve, but we lose part of the point of service if we complain or we expect something from the service. It's not a service when you get recouped for it, right? 
That is now a wage. This is employment. Genuine service is I've done it. Nothing's coming back. So you should actually glory in the fact when you've picked up your husband's clothes for the gazillionth time and he says nothing. You should be like, praise the Lord. <laughs> no, my wife's not in here so I can get away with that one. Um, hey, the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise, right? When we humble ourselves and we choose to accept God's truth, we can become wise and we can live wisely. Let's go to our final point. See here in Revelation 3, 20 through 22. I want to go right to uh, the note. The church on fire is not heart hard-hearted and is serving as, it's supposed to be Jesus' hands. That's the other typo. I apologize for that. And it's uh, serving as Jesus' hands. Now, I want you to notice two things uh, about that passage in 20 through 21. The first in 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We have an intimacy with Christ that is unparalleled. When we have accepted him, he comes into us and dines with us. One of the most intimate things we can do is dining with people. That's why most dates involve what? Going out to eat, right? When you, when you invite somebody over, what do you normally do? You play, what's that game called? Cornhole, or do you, do you eat? You generally eat, right? It's one of the most intimate things you can do. It's a sign of just fellowship, etc. We have an intimacy with Christ that is unparalleled. But notice what he says. He stands at the door and knocks. If anyone hears my voice opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. He does not say, I have chosen you. I'm coming into your heart whether you like it or not. He says, if you will ask, he will come. And obviously, this can be extrapolated to all our areas of life. He wants to be involved in your kids' activities. He wants to be involved in your prayer life, in your job decisions, in how you serve, etc. He wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. You simply need to ask him to come in there. There's a level of intimacy that is beyond comprehension. Nothing else matches this. It is a, such a beautiful thing. That's what James 4, I'd encourage you to read that entire chapter. I'm going to cherry pick this verse because I think it summarizes this chapter. But draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. There's two aspects of this verse. We'll get in the second aspect. But we have a need for intimacy with God. Now, notice there it says, cleanse, cleanse your hands, you're sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, the second aspect of this verse in this passage, these last three verses, is not just intimacy, but responsibility. We have a responsibility, right? That's what we have this mission statement for at Alpha Baptist to remind us that we don't just have an intimacy with God, but we have a responsibility to Him. So many of the parables talk about the people that once you recognize how amazing grace is, Paul refers to himself as a slave. Not because he was a literal slave, but because the weight of the grace was so immeasurable that how could you not respond in that manner? Those, that is why the people that may have been the most lost are generally the most passionate about Christ because they see the gulf that was there. So don't ever forget the responsibility we have to not just be intimate with God, but to do what he has called us to do. You know, it talks about there, we're going to reign with him on the throne, be co-heirs, co-rulers. Um, you know, I made a joke with Brother Roger back there that, uh, you know, everybody wants to be a leader until they start having to lead people, because <laughs> people are difficult. Everybody wants to be a believer, well, I shouldn't say that. We, we want everybody to be a believer. Once you become a believer, you still have a responsibility. You're not earning your salvation, but you have a responsibility to become sanctified. To not develop a hard heart in terms of not listening. And to just get in this mantra of, it's enough, I'm at the finish line. Salvation is not the finish line. It is the beginning because 
Prior to salvation, you're dead in your sins, you're dead spiritually, nothing matters except for condemnation. All you're bu- doing is building condemnation. Once you're saved, you're now in the kingdom of God and you now have the responsibility to go out, do the Great Commission, serve the body of Christ, and to fellowship and to enjoy life. But true joy is found in serving and sacrificing. Now, I don't know about many of you, but I, I've always been the dreamer type. Like when I was in high school, I was always like, yeah, I'm going to play sports and I'm going to do these scores, touchdown, do this. I actually wasn't very good in sports in high school, so none of that ever happened. <laughs> then I went to college, kind of the same thing, and, uh, you know, same kind of visions of grandeur and, and went out in the military and had all these visions, like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, fight 17 different aircraft and eject and go save prisoners of war. You know what I mean? Just I've always just mentally been off like that. Um, and I don't know what God has planned for me as, as a Christian. You know, I always like to think of myself as a Christian warrior because that is how I see our role, especially in this age. And if you've heard nothing from me in this entire sermon series, anything, I want you to take away this final message, which is simply this. If Athel Baptist is where you are supposed to be, then join us, commit with us, serve with us, sacrifice with us. If it's not, it's it's fine. Just let us, you don't have to let us know. We appreciate you let us know it because we want to send you out in love. We are never at any point if you come to us and say, you know what, Pastor Richard, just don't get your preaching uh, and I can't stand this rotation system. The people are too loving and hugging. Like, I've had enough. Beautiful. Please let us know how we can help you find the church that will fit your style. And then go find that church and join them and serve them. Your commitment to a church should be the same commitment you have to a family. That is what God expects. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because that's biblical truth. Do good to all, but first to the body of Christ. And if you aspire to do something great for God's kingdom, I remind you of Luke 16.10, which is the end of the parable of the unjust steward. You need to be faithful in what is least before he will give you most. He just doesn't come out one day and say, you know what, Richard, you've been watching a lot of college football. Um, You're really good at not doing anything around the house. And, you know, you work a lot. So I'm going to give you this opportunity to go debate with a non-believer. Like, that's not going to happen, right? It's going to happen you served in the nursery, you served in hospitality, you served in the men's ministry, women's ministry, drop point, grow, Awana, whatever. You serve at the local level, and as you prove faithful in the little things, God will continue to give you more. And it's not a works-based thing if you think about it. Think about it from a fighter aspect, right? If I was in professional fighting, I can't go from like being a couch potato to fighting the champion right? It's not going to work out very well. In the same way, God uses all these times of service and sacrifice to build the character that is going to be the most advantageous when he puts you in that amazing role. So again, when you get the chance to serve and you're not going to get any gratitude, any thanks for it, you should praise the Lord. What a wonderful thing that I'm not going to get praise from man, and I know I'm getting praise from you because you're the only one that knows that I'm cleaning up this dog poop on the carpet right now. <laughs> Wife's not even going to have to smell it. I'm going to take care of it myself. She'll never have to know about it. I'm not going to tell her because I want you to know, Lord. That is next level mature Christianity, honestly. When you get to the point where you don't need man's praise, man's gratitude, and you are serving God, that is next level. And that's what I want us to strive for. And that's why we do what we do here at Alpha Baptist. We want you to join us. So, Tim, go ahead and come up. So, as Tim comes up, the band Noodles, I think as it's called in mu- musical parlance. Um,
Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for this day, Lord. So thankful for your blessings. Lord, as a father, I just can't say how thankful I am for Athel Baptist. I'm thankful for this church who's as uh, always so gracious to my preaching, and I pray that I always just uh, bring your message, Lord. If nothing else, uh, I'll bring it in a passionate manner. Lord, I lift up uh, professors, family. Lord, it was a loss that was unexpected. I pray for all those. Who, so many lives were affected, and I'm just so thankful to know that he's walking with you right now. Lord, I look for the day that I can see him and other friends on the other side of glory. And I know it's not my time, Lord. I pray that you strengthen me uh, for the work that is ahead. I straight pray that you strengthen all these believers. Lord, I just pray that you tug on everybody's heart. That if Athel Baptist is where you want them to be planted, Lord, that they commit, they join with us. We have so many here that already serve that already sacrificed, and, and for those, I, I pray that you thank them in the way that only you can thank them. We are grateful for all the members that give so much, and really just lift up my prayer to the minority who, who may have not chosen this church, or let us guide them to another, or let us bring them in, but let us find ways that they can serve and sacrifice so that they can grow more Christ-like, which is the point of church. Lord, personally, I, Lord, I also just want to lift up, uh, you know, I have a um, potential occupation change coming my way, and I just pray your guidance and your mercy and, and your uh, just direction with that, Lord. Lord, it's been such a wonderful time here at Athel Baptist, and I look forward to many years, and I look forward to my kids. You know, Professor was a mentor to myself as a dad, and, and I pray for all those who have been willing to step up and be mentors here at Athel Baptist. Lord, if nothing else, we love you here at ABC, and I pray that you always give us the spine to stand up for your truth, regardless of what the world thinks, regardless of, of the cost, that we always stand on your, tra- your truth and depend on your truth. We accept it. As it's plainly stated, we don't discount it. We don't deflect it. We believe it, and we move forward in faith that you will bring the promises that you deliver. All these things we do in Jesus Christ's loving name. Amen. I have decided.